Good morning. If you will take your Bibles and open up to 1 John chapter 5 at verse 13 with me. 1 John chapter 5 at verse 13. I uh, would just like to announce to the church family so you can be praying even as your hearts as we sit under the preached word of God that our sister Julie Von Cleek has been in labor for a little while now since Friday evening and um, is currently being taken back for a cesarean section and so let's pray for the safety of Julie and their baby. I'll pray for them in just a moment. Let's also be praying in our hearts for our brother Johnny Harris as he preaches to the saints at First Baptist Advance this morning. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13. John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would be with our sister now as she goes back for the C-section, please. Give the doctor skill, keep her safe and the baby safe, and give them the joy of holding their baby in their arms shortly. Oh, Lord, help them in these early days of parenting. Meet all of their needs. Oh, Lord, show yourself faithful to them and help them to rejoice in you and know your fatherly love to them all the more sweetly and concretely because of having their own child. Oh, Lord, we pray for Johnny. We thank you for uh, the ministry of our brother to the saints at First Baptist Church in advance this morning. Please attend his words. Spirit of God, carry your word home to the hearts of the people. Oh, cause it to affect that which you will in them, and that Christ would be formed in them to his glory. Lord, we pray for ourselves now as we come to your word. What greater foundation do we have than we have just sung about? Oh, what a sure foundation you have laid for your saints in your excellent word, and what a sure foundation we have in 1 John's gospel, his letter. We pray that you would feed our hearts, feed our faith, and fix our eyes on Christ through your word. We pray in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. How do you know that you are a believer, or that you are a true follower of Christ? How do you or how can anyone know that they've been forgiven of their sins? Uh, we, Christians, in this age between uh, the, the coming of Christ and the final return of Christ, live in the already but not yet. We still wrestle against uh, many temptations in the world outside us. We wrestle with our own flesh dwelling within us, and that introduces uh, some dissonance and some complexity to our Christian experience, and it makes us raise questions at times about the state of our soul. A questioning our relationship with God and are we really safe in Christ is a common experience for almost every Christian. This morning, that is our topic. I want to talk about Christian assurance. The title of the sermon is That You May Know, pulling directly from the words of 1 John 5, 13. 1 John 5, 13 will just serve as the entry point for what will really be a topical survey of the whole of 1 John's teaching on the topic of Assurance. Oh, the pastoral burden of my message, brothers and sisters, is to bring comfort, to bring encouragement uh, to any in our midst who are struggling with assurance today or will struggle with assurance at some point in the future. Christ's word and Christ himself uh, tells us that he wants to see his people be whole. And so I pray that his word would have that effect, that it would make us whole. Uh, John's letter is not primarily an evangelistic letter, though it has massive relevance for anyone in this room who is not a follower of Christ. No, John's letter is targeted towards believers, and so is my sermon this morning. I just wanted to give a pastoral disclaimer up front. Uh, The topic of assurance of salvation is delicate and experientially complex, which means that it needs to be handled with pastoral sensitivity and biblical carefulness. Some believers are safe in Christ and will be held safe in Christ until they see him face to face, but they don't feel that way. And then there are some unbelievers who profess faith in Christ and feel all the safety and security in the world, 
and yet are not safe in Christ. These two groups of people often exist side by side in the same church, in the same gathering. Another important truth that we need to remember up front is that assurance is not the same thing as faith. It is possible for someone who has truly put their faith in Christ, however mustard seed like that faith is, however small yet true, sincere, it is possible for someone who is truly safe in Christ to battle with assurance their entire Christian walk and yet enter glory safely. That is possible. Next, it's important to acknowledge up front that most true believers struggle with assurance. We need to normalize that. Uh, That is common to man, common to Christian man, which means they struggle with it not just for one reason but for all kinds of reasons, which means that there's not one silver bullet remedy that I or anyone else can offer to alleviate your particular struggle with assurance. The root causes of assurance are many. And so it would be a bad infectious disease doctor that applied the same antibiotic to any and every infection. So it would be a bad physician of the soul to put blanket solutions for every struggle of assurance. I want to be careful not to do that this morning. I've approached this text and this topic and and our church family, you the people of God, with a sense of trembling, very aware that in our midst there are likely believers and unbelievers. I don't want anything that I say from 1 John's gospel or letter this morning to, uh, to assure somebody who is not a believer that they are in fact safe in Christ. And I pray that none of my words would convince a saint that they are a sinner who is estranged from God when in fact they are held fast by Christ. Well, with these introductory thoughts behind us, I have three main points for us to consider. Uh, We'll start first with the foundational question, and then we'll look at the context of John's gospel, or letter, and then we will assess John's three tests for assurance. John will provide three tests for assurance. But let's begin first with a foundational question. Does God want his children to live with the confident assurance that they are, in fact, his children. You ever thought about that question? Well, the Bible's teaching on this, brother, sister, is resoundingly clear, and it is a resounding yes. Well, this is textually transparent from all over the Bible, and it is logically necessary from the nature of God as a good father, well, that he would want his children and make a way for his children to know and to feel confidence in their relationship with him. I'll share just a few texts that would drive this point home. Isaiah 26, 3, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Romans 8, 38 to 39, for I am sure, or I am persuaded, you could translate that, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Hebrews 10, 22 and 23, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure Water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Why? For he who promised is faithful. And then our text this morning, 1 John 5, 13, says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know. That you may know. We could multiply texts. The point is, is that God clearly desires for you, his children, to feel confidence, to feel security in your relationship with him as your heavenly father. Another important truth to realize is that assurance is to be actively pursued and not passively 
demanded or expected. It is to be actively pursued. This is clear from the scripture. 2 Peter 1.10 says, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. Colossians 2, 1 and 2. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and listen to this, to reach all the riches of full assurance. See, the Spirit of God through Paul is telling us that all the riches of full assurance is something that God wants his children to reach. And it's something that we should strive for, that we should lay hold of. Hebrews 6.11 says, And we desire, we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end. So the scripture lays out the idea of assurance as a thing to be pursued with diligence, with earnestness. So brother, sister, let us commit ourselves to pursue assurance in our walk with the Lord. That's the first point. Let's move on to our second point and look at the context of John so that we can better appreciate the tests for assurance that John will give us. So first, who is the author of this letter? John was one of the 12 disciples who lived and walked with Christ. And if you look at uh, John, 1 John 1, verse 1, John identifies himself as an eyewitness who had seen Christ and heard Christ and touched Christ with his hands. You think about that? Who's talking to us this morning? The man that's talking to us is a man who touched Christ. He felt him. He heard him. He saw him, which means that John is qualified to speak to us about Christ. He's qualified to speak to us about what a relationship with Christ looks like. It also means that this letter is not a fabricated fiction uh, that we are holding to without great confidence and reason today. No, this letter is not a fabricated fiction. This letter is grounded in eyewitness historical testimony. Our faith, brothers, sisters, is grounded in eyewitness testimony. It is an objective faith. It is a great and true historical reality. So that's the author who is writing this letter. Who is he writing to? John is writing to the church or churches in Ephesus in Asia Minor. And the believers there were reeling and questioning the status of their relationship with God after some influential false teachers in the church had unsettled the believers through their false teaching and then left, likely to form their own community, likely to form their own church. And John is writing to these saints who are reeling. This is a pastoral letter. This is not a heady, intellectual, abstract letter. This is written to real people who were struggling because there were some influential and persuasive teachers who were leading them into error. We see something of the occasion of the letter in chapter 2, verse 19. If you'll turn there, look at 2.19. It gives us insight into why John is writing. He says, they, talking about these false teachers, went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would not have continued. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. So why is John writing? Uh, Simply put, he is writing to reassure and strengthen the faith of the true believers in Ephesus. He is like a battlefield medic who is trying to bind up the bruised and the broken who have been pummeled on the spiritual battlefield by these false teachers. John is pastoral in this letter. And John specifically wants to address the error that these false teachers were leading the people into. And there were two major components, uh, to the two major errors that these false teachers were promulgating in the midst. And they were major and they were faith-shaking errors. They weren't just intellectual disagreements that didn't seep into our experience. 
So much of what we believe must dictate our experience. Do you all get that about the Christian life? It's a, it's a whole of life faith. It's entrusting all of ourselves to all of Christ. And what we believe about God in Christ matters for our experience. And John is writing against these two faith-shaking errors. One was that these false teachers some way denied that Christ came in the flesh. And by that denial, it would remove all grounds for any confidence that he actually shed his blood for the forgiveness of their sins. Uh, To put a theological label on that, they denied the incarnation and thereby eviscerated any hope of penal substitutionary atonement in Christ. No Christ in the flesh, there is no God in my place on the cross. It's just another man. And what can another sinful man up there do about my sins? So John is addressing uh, this erroneous teaching about Christ not coming in the flesh. And the second error, the major error that he wants to address is that these false teachers somehow or another minimized the sinfulness of sin. And that rocked the assurance of the believers by blurring uh, the community of faith, the community of Christ, and the world. Uh, so, so these false teachers in some way minimized sin in such a way that they could tolerate sin or that they could say, I have no sin in me. We see both of those errors come up in John's letter. Uh, so what distinguishes Christians from the world if we indulge the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life just like the world does? If we have a theology of grace that allows us to blur the lines between holiness and Christ's likeness and our relationship with the world, we will experience problems with our assurance and our relationship with God. And John is addressing that very experience in the life of the believers in Ephesus. So that's the context of John's letter. Uh, Let's look now at the three tests of assurance that God provides for us. We'll spend the rest of our time here and we'll spend the majority of our time on the first test. Almost every commentator agrees that John offers at least three tests for assurance in his gospel. Uh, So some will conjecture whether he offers others as well. Um, Those could be, the others that are suggested could be enveloped underneath the three tests that we are going to talk about this morning. And these three tests are the faith test or the truth test, you could call it, the obedience test and the love test. The faith test, the truth test, the obedience test, the love test. As an engineer or a builder who designs a structure and then builds it, they want to exert pressure on it from different angles and at different points to guarantee that their design was a good design and it will withstand the pressure. John is, John is doing something like that for us. He is He is giving us a framework and a grid for how to think about our relationship with God. And he's calling us. If we were to exert pressure, if anyone were to look into our lives and to exert pressure on us in terms of our faith, our holiness or obedience, and our love, that we would be found, those things would be found present. And we would be found to be standing in faith, in holiness, and in love. So first, let's look at the faith test that John offers to us. And this is by far, brother and sister, the most foundational of these tests. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Everyone who believes that Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, has been born of God. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. The test of faith means that the primary way that you can know you are a child of God is do you believe in the Christ that the Bible offers and holds out to us? Do you believe in Christ as the Son of God who took on flesh and who physically and actually suffered in our place for our sins and shed his blood so that we could be forgiven? This is the faith test. See, John is going right to the heart of the gospel with this first test. And he's looking for two main things. He's looking first for 
clarity on who Christ is, and then he's looking for personal faith in Christ. Clarity on who Christ is and then personal faith in Christ. Let's look first at the clear picture that John gives us of Jesus, of the clear picture of Jesus. First, how does John talk about Jesus? He says he is the incarnate Son of God. A look at chapter 1, verse 1. In the face of false teachers who denied uh, that the Son of God could and would take on flesh, basically denied the hypostatic union of Christ's divine and human natures together, it was something that was so mysterious it blew their minds, and it led them to try to compartmentalize their understanding of God in such a way that they could box him up in a package that would allow them to explain him to their friends, to the neighbor next to them. There is mystery in the infinite and uncreated one. And if the infinite one reveals himself to the finite creatures that he has made, there will always be a ceiling for how high we can go in our understanding and comprehending who God is. And a dangerous thing we can do when we are confronted with mystery is to try to explain it away. We should go no further in our explanations than the Bible clearly gives us. And these false teachers fell prone to the error of trying to explain away a mystery and how the eternal God could take on flesh. And John is defending the, the infleshed incarnation of Christ. Because without the infleshed incarnation of Christ, there is no sacrifice for sins. You get that, right? There is no sacrifice for sins. Chapter 1, verse 1, so in the face of these false teachers who deny that Christ the Son took on flesh, John asserts that he and I, other eyewitnesses physically heard with their ears, saw with their eyes, and touched with their hands. They touched the eternal Son of God in the flesh who was from the beginning and was with the Father in glory. See, John wants to know if you believe that about Christ. Is he the one who was in the beginning and yet took on flesh, entered his creation? Who is the Christ that John tells us we need to believe to be assured that we are saved and forgiven? He is God in the flesh. Second, he is the author and giver of life. Look at verses 1 and 2 together. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard and which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life. Or 1 John 5, 11, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. So how do we know life? John is asking He's saying, do you believe that Christ alone is the author and giver of life? Next, in the clear picture that he presents of Christ, he draws our attention to the physical reality of Jesus' death for sinners. Look at 1 John 1, 7. See, John calls us to anchor our hope for forgiveness entirely in the reality of Christ's shed blood for sinners. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. Chapter 3, verse 16 says, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And so John wants to know, do you believe in a God who physically substituted himself in your place? What must we believe to be saved? John says we must believe that. Fourth, his death, Christ's death, propitiated or appeased and averted the wrath of God away from us. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 says, And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. See, John wants to know, do you believe that Jesus took on himself the full weight of the wrath of God Friend, such that there is none left for you. Believer in Christ, do you believe that you are under the wrath of God? 
still? After the sacrifice, the all-sufficient, the full, final, and complete sacrifice that Christ has made for you, John wants to know, do you believe that Jesus died physically to avert the wrath of God in himself away from you? Fifth, John tells us that Jesus is our righteous advocate before the Father in heaven. He is our righteous advocate before the Father in heaven. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. One of the purpose statements in John's letter. He's writing so that they may not sin. But if anyone does sin, he'd already said in 1 John 1, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So here in 2.1 he says, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. My friend, do you think that God the Father can deny the Son? Do you think that God can maintain his unity in his triunity if he denies the Son's advocacy for you? You think of what secures your eternal salvation, what should give you hope and confidence in the faith. It's what Paul's talking about in Romans 8. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. So he's anchoring the the Romans believers' assurance and grounding of their salvation in justification in, in God through Christ. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who is interceding for us. You see, Christ is interceding for his saints. All those whom he died to justify, he secures as part of the unified package of salvation. He secures their eternal salvation by pleading their case before the Father. Do you think that God could deny the sacrifice of his son and hold your sin against you if Christ, in fact, pleads for you and died for you? Do you believe that as we will sing that he ever lives above for me to intercede? His all-redeeming love, his precious blood to plead. This is the Jesus that John clearly presents and he invites all of his readers to place their faith in. What must we believe to be saved? Who must we believe in to be saved? This is the portrait of Jesus that John calls us to believe in. Next, let's think about the personal response of faith that is required. So John calls us to a personal response of faith. He tells us first that faith is commanded by God for all people. 1 John 3, 23 says, And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. So faith should be viewed as duty and delight. God is good to command that which is good for us. And more than commanding what is good for us, God is even better yet, even more generous still. He then gives us the very thing that he commands from us. Ephesians 2 will talk about being saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So so God's good to command what would be good for our eternal life and joy and satisfaction in him. And then, recognizing as Ephesians 2 would show us that we are spiritually dead and unable to generate this faith on on our own, he then gives us life through his spirit by his son and gives us the gift of faith and brings life where there was none. Second, The personal response of faith involves the recognition and confession of our sins. So John has no category for a faith that doesn't confess its sins. Look at verses 8 and 9, chapter 1. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he 
is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, confession of sin in the Christian life is not a one and done get out of jail free card. Confession of sin is a pattern of life for the true follower of Christ. John wants to know if you are walking according to that pattern. Is it possible that your lack of assurance stems from covering over and caressing pet sins in your life rather than confessing them and dealing with them and turning from them with God's help? Or conversely, is it possible that your lack of assurance rises because you think that you should be an exception to the rule that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves? Sometimes... I've felt this way, and I've spoken with so many followers of Christ who have felt this way. This seems to be one of the most common causes or roots for assurance cropping, or a lack of assurance cropping up. Sin rears its head in our lives, and then we step back and we wonder, am, am I the real deal? Am I really in Christ? Some of us need to think more about the reality that if we say we have no sins, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. It is not, our assurance is not based on whether or not sin is present and active in some way in our lives. Our assurance is more anchored on what we do with that sin. We take it to Christ the same way we did when we first heard the good news of the gospel, of God himself burying our sins for us, and we run to him yet again and again and again. The one who is assured in Christ will be running to the cross of Christ daily with their sins. They will be confessing them and dealing with them. And this is a large part of Paul's argument in Romans 8 where he links the Spirit's presence and leading in us uh, by whom we have the spirit of adoption and cry, Abba, Father. That is linked with our war against the sins of the flesh. So how uh, Paul says in Romans 8, how do you know that the Spirit of God is in you? You war. You fight. You take up arms and you persistently and consistently, never endingly fight against the sin that is in your life. Might it be that we lack assurance because we've grown weary in fighting sin and we've fostered pet sins? So this faith is a personal faith that lives out in daily repentance. This faith, third, looks to Christ as a personal Savior. Chapter 4, verse 15 says, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him. That's the person that God's, God abides in. See, neither Jesus nor John call us to a generic or an impersonal faith. It is not enough to agree that Jesus died to save sinners in general. We must believe, if we are to be saved, that he went to the cross in my place for my sins. Christ saves us personally from our sins. Chapter 5, verse 1, he says that everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Everyone, each one of us is called to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That is the grounds and the assurance of our salvation. John talks about faith in tangible ways in his gospel. If we were to pull from John's writing elsewhere and look at his gospel, uh, he, he so helpfully, pastorally in his gospel, talks about faith in ways that appeal to our desires, our passions, our affections, not just to our intellect, not just to systematic packages of understanding who God is and how he's revealed himself. No, John presents faith as like the woman at the well coming to drink from the wellspring of living water. John presents faith like the bread of life offered to the crowds. Oh, come and, and eat of the bread of life and be sustained forever. Have full satisfaction in him. This is the way that John presents faith. Friend, could it be that you're struggling with assurance because you have compartmentalized your walk with Christ 
and you are not feeding your faith on him the way he invites you to in his word and in prayer. We cannot feed ourselves on a verse a week or a sermon a week. If you are not personally pursuing the knowledge of your creator and your savior, you cannot expect to experience the riches of the fullness of assurance. You must lay hold of Christ. You must run after him personally. No one can can pursue that for you. No one can do that for you. Christ is calling you to seek him in his word. Our assurance in the faith will typically track with our pursuit of Christ via the means of grace that he has laid out for us. That's that's just a maxim that we need to, to remember whenever we are dealing with struggles with assurance in the faith. Our assurance in the faith will typically track with our engagement with the means of God, the, the means of grace that God has laid out for us. Fourth aspect of this personal faith that we are called to. The faith that Jesus calls us to, according to John, is an abiding faith. It's a faith that lasts, that perseveres. It's not a one-time event that gets us in the door and then we're done. No, like repentance and faith, which are two sides of the same coin, faith is a daily going to Christ as a way of life. It is entrusting all of ourselves to all of him for our salvation. Chapter 2, verse 28, John says, And now, little children, abide in him. Abide in him. So that when he comes, we may have assurance and not shrink back in shame at his coming. Is it possible that you lack assurance because you place too much weight not on a day by day turning to Christ, looking to Christ as your Savior, but on an event at a one point, a singular fixed point in the past. I have talked with many people who have struggled with assurance because they were anchoring it too heavily and identifying a day when they were saved. You know what's a much more helpful question for your soul than when was I saved in the past? It's how do you know you are safe in Christ today? How can anyone know that they are safe in Christ today? What saves you back then, today, and forever is an abiding faith in Christ. Let me be unequivocally clear that this first test, the test of faith in Christ on the objective grounds of his life, death, and resurrection, is, in a sense, the sole and primary grounds of our assurance of salvation. The other two tests must be viewed as inferior to this test. And the other two tests must be seen not as equal to this test, but as fruits that grow out of the soil in which true faith in Christ already exists. So are you living in anxious fear of whether or not your soul is eternally safe in Christ? The remedy is the same today as the day when you first heard the gospel and went to Christ. Run to him, brother, sister, run to him afresh today. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Remember that he came not for the righteous but for sinners. Remember what he said in John 6, 37, that whoever comes to me I will by no means cast out. And what he said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There, he's talking about rest for your souls. Christ means what he says. May God give us grace to take him at his word. He offers himself the same to you today, believer, as he did when you were coming out of the deep darkness of your sin initially. Before we move on to look at the second test, Uh, There's an important thing that we need to appreciate about the relationship between these three tests. Uh, So these three tests for assurance have been uh, likened to a three-legged stool. And I I said this in as many words a moment ago, ago. The stool analogy breaks down unless you allow for one of the legs to be much more significant than the other two legs. So faith in the finished work of Christ is the sole ground 
of the believer's salvation, and it's the chief ground of the assurance of their salvation. Do you understand the distinction there? What we were talking about, faith in the objective work of Christ on the cross for sinners, is the ground for our salvation and our assurance. And what we're about to talk about when we talk about holiness of life or obedience, and we talk about love shown towards one another, they are not the ground for our, uh, our salvation. Faith alone and Christ alone is. But John offers us help. And he offers us help in the terms of looking at our obedience, faith-filled obedience, and faith-filled love for one another as grounds for our assurance of salvation. John will not allow a one-legged stool of assurance that ignores obedience to Christ and love for one another. And so neither can we. And so the remaining two tests of obedience are like fruits that are going to spring up out of that first ground of faith in Christ. So let's look at the obedience test. Uh, You could also call this, using John's words, uh, the walking in the light test or the keeping his commandments test. John asserts repeatedly throughout his letter that those who have saving fellowship with God will walk in the light rather than darkness, will keep his commandments and will practice righteousness. The assertion here is that true believers live transformed lives. This is clear across John's letter. Uh, Look at chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie. We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus' son cleanses us from all sin. Or look at chapter 2, verse 3. And by this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. You know what would be a good devotional exercise for your soul, brother, sister, if you're struggling with assurance? Go through John's letter. It's short. It's five chapters. You can read it in 15 minutes. And underline every time he talks about knowing. He says, by this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Or verse 29 of chapter 2, if you know that he is righteous, you may be sure, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Or chapter 3 and verse 10, by this it is evident, it is evident, it is obvious who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. And all of this, all of of John's uh, admonitions to look at our lives and look for holiness, keeping his commandments, is downstream from 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. Look at 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5. Chapter 1 verse 5 says that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. Uh, To say that God is light in this context is to say that God is holy. It's to say that he is morally and ethically pure. That there is no blemish of sin in his character, no. And that means that if God is absolutely pure and holy, then if he chooses to save sinners... In the way he goes about accomplishing their salvation, he must change them. He must transform them such that they become light too. God cannot tolerate darkness. And so anyone who he has created new life through faith in Christ, you will see them increasingly reflect the light of Christ to the glory of God. That must happen. This means that all true saving faith will produce transformed lives that increasingly increasingly reflect the character of God. And Paul says exactly this in Ephesians 5.8. He says, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light. Therefore, walk as children of the light. See, through our union with Christ, Paul says we are light. 
And so the call of Paul, the call of John, this side of heaven in the era of the already but not yet, is to increasingly live out who we are in Christ. There are realities, believer, that Christ has secured for you that are not finally and fully worked out in you. Uh, So our salvation is past, present, and future. It is fixed and anchored and uh, finally secured in the completed work of Christ on the cross. But it is also being secured by his advocating for us right now. And it will be finally consummated on the last day. Uh, So Christ's work of salvation is expansive. He is working to change us. And on the last day, the Lord will complete his work in us with such brilliant finality that in Matthew 13, 43, Jesus says, on the last day, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. You think about that. What is God doing in you, believer, through Christ, by the power of his spirit? If he has changed you, he is working light in you that reflects his character of light. Because he cannot tolerate the darkness. And he is increasingly rooting out the dark corners of the rooms of our life during this side of the the age, the era, this side of heaven. And on that last day when we are glorified, we will shine like the lights in the sun. What will it be like to behold each other transformed to shine like the light of the sun in the kingdom of heaven on the last day. What a glorious thought to think of over this afternoon. We must be clear on two things here in the obedience test. Uh, John is not talking about our outward holiness or obedience as the grounds of our salvation, but as the fruit. And second, John is not advocating for perfectionism. He's advocating for a pattern of pursuing holiness which involves persistent repentance and faith. And so what marks the believer is not perfectionism. That cannot be it. He's disallowed that. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. No. But neither can we allow for indulging sin to the fullest uh, by indulging the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life in us. No. We fight. We make war. We seek after Christ and abide in him so that we could bear much fruit. And there's so many points of connection between our practical obedience and our experience of salvation. It would be impossible to explore them all. But Jesus told us, and I want to take us to some other words that Jesus gave us uh, that are a grid or a lens that he provides to help us think through. How do we know that we or anyone is in the faith? He told us, You will know them by their fruits. This is Matthew 7. And whoever abides in me and in my word will bear much fruit. So why did Jesus say that? What what was the, the purpose for him saying that? Yes, it's true that we could be deceived. We are not God. God alone looks on the heart and sees the heart. It is true that we can be deceived by a person's profession and by their life. We cannot predict the state of a person's soul with 100% accuracy. But that corner case is not what Jesus is talking about here. He is saying you will know them by their fruits. He is providing us with a lens so that we can assess with reasonable confidence of whether or not we are in the faith or not. He's saying the pattern of our life should make it evident to all and obvious to all that we are Christ's, that he is ours. I've often, in, in particularly working in youth ministry and having folks come to me sharing about they believe they've been converted in their teenage years, just encourage them to be patient And seeing that faith work itself out and produce the fruits of in keeping with repentance. You can safely say to somebody, praise the Lord, I hope and trust that that is true of you. But your life should change. Christ should be doing a work in you to shape and to mold you in such a way that it will be obvious to everyone that you are in fact walking with 
Christ. Could it be for some of us that our struggle with assurance stems from being slothful in pursuing Christ, lives of Christ-like holiness? Or could it be possible that we are still holding too tightly to the things of the world? Our assurance will be buoyed up by increasingly committing ourselves to pursue holiness. Get that God's, God's holiness is always the path of life. If the author says go down this path and not that path, this path is the path to human flourishing, joy, satisfaction, fulfillment. And so his holiness is a path that tends towards our happiness, and it's a path that will tend towards your assurance in the faith. And may we be ever more committed as the people of God to be like Christ and to have Christ formed in us through his word. Third, and finally, let's look now at the love test. Another major fruit and marker of the regenerate, per regenerate person is their love for God and one another. Look at chapter 2, verses 9 to 10. Whoever says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light. Or chapter 3 and verse 10. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. 3.14, I feel like is just a few verses down. Verse 14 is one of the clearest. We know that we have passed. We know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. There are three points I want us to see under the love test. A first, God's love for us is the great grounds of all Christian assurance. It's not our love for him. It is God's love for us. Uh, chapter 4 and verse 10 says, And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. See, the great hope that the Christian has is that God has decisively shown his love for us in the coming of Christ. Well, this is exactly what Paul goes after at the end of Romans 8, uh, when he talks about Christ being the fullness of what God has done for us. Who shall bring any charge against us? What more can we say to the work that he has done in predestining, calling, justifying, glorifying us? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? No, he's saying it's, it's the, the work of God through Christ, the love shown to us through his Son, that is our fixed and final hope that outweighs, should outweigh our fickle and fluctuating feelings. That we cannot, we cannot anchor our salvation in our feelings. We cannot anchor whether or not we've been made right with God on how we're doing in a given particular day. There's all kinds of reasons we might be feeling a certain way on a certain day. No, we anchor our hope of salvation in the objective reality of God's love shown to us in Christ. Second, John tells us that this love is meant to be an antidote that replaces fear with confidence. Look at uh, chapter 4, verses 16 to 19. These are some of the sweetest words in all of John's letter. Chapter 4, verses 16 to 19. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love, we love because he first loved us. Brother, sister, if you have placed your faith in Christ and therefore have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father, your Father does not want you to live in fear. Perfect love and a knowledge of his perfect love for us, John tells us, is what casts out fear. The medicine for some of us who struggle with assurance is to think more often and more deeply on the love of God shown for us in Christ. 
We need to look there much more than we look at our obedience or our love. But thirdly, John does tell us that our love for one another is a proof, is a test by which we can know that we have known the love of God and are his children. Look at chapter 4, 11 and 12. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Uh, No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us. What a thought. And his love is perfected in us. Same chapter, chapter 4, 20 and 21. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he does not love his brother whom he has seen. If he... um, For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God does not, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So the love for brother is really the aspect of love that John talks about the most in his letter. And this is what he wants us to think about. He wants us to to look at our relationships and to assess for love for one another. Are we living that out, the dynamic of our relationships? And particularly, he emphasizes the arena of our love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. So Emmanuel Church, brother, sister, how is your love for your brothers and sisters that are part of this church family? You can't, in an embodied way, love every believer in the world. But God has given you a wonderful opportunity to love this people. And it's in the church that the manifold wisdom of God is being made known to angelic beings in the heavenly realms. And one of the ways that it's being made known is in the way we love one another. Does does your life demonstrate these dynamics of love towards one another? Well, what is Christian love? What does it look like to love one another? Christian love can be defined as a commitment of the will, an affection of the heart, and a sacrifice of the life for the highest good of another. Christian love is a commitment of the will, an affection of the heart, and a sacrifice of the life for the highest good of another. So Christian love is more than a feeling. It is a resolved commitment to love God and to love others no matter how we feel. It doesn't matter how we feel from one sense. Our call is to love God and to love one another. And yet, Christian love is not cold and passionless love. According to chapter 3, verse 17, it opens its heart rather than closing it to the good of others. And this love also must be a sacrificial love. It's a love that can't see the brother in need and just acknowledge it and say, I'm sorry you're in need. I feel for you. And then not do a thing about it. No, Christian love must be embodied love, just as our Savior is an embodied Savior. So could it be that our lack of assurance stems from a lack of love for one another? We cannot expect to drink from this stream of assurance if we have siloed ourselves off from meaningful relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ. If we are are doing the hermit thing, and we're just thinking, I need me and my Bible and the Spirit of God in me, and that's all I need, that is not the type of Christianity and not the type of faith that Christ nor John holds out to us. If we silo ourselves off from the community, we can't make sense pretty much the entire Bible, and then we will not have the assurance that we could have. God wants us to experience greater assurance through love for the brothers and sisters. We ought to bear their burdens. We ought to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. And I want to briefly mention one last arena of love that might affect our assurance. Look at chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. This is the last text we'll turn to. John says, Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Some of us may struggle 
with assurance because there are still areas of life where we are holding too tightly to the things of this world. Could it be that our fixation and fatuation with our health, our financial stability, our position and respectability among others or our possessions play too much into our sense of stability and satisfaction in life and in God? Might it be that the flower of assurance would grow and bloom if we committed ourselves to weed out the cares of this world from the garden of our life, if we committed ourselves to weed out the cares of this world, what might our assurance in Christ look like? Well, in closing, I want to ask the question that we asked at the beginning of the sermon, the one that we have, I am sure, asked ourselves countless times, how can I know that I am a Christian? How can I know that I am safe in the arms of God? The answer is the same to believers and unbelievers. Whether you are a Christian or whether you're not a Christian, it's run to Christ. Look to Christ. Fix your eyes on Christ. Fill your vision with Him. Before you get caught up in looking inward and trying to assess for what is the pattern of obedience in my life, am I actually following the commands of my Savior? Or what does my love for my brother or sister actually look like? Is it there? Is it present? To what degree? Before we do any of that calculus, look to Christ. For 10 days, before we would spend 10 seconds looking at ourselves, look to Christ, the same Christ who said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We'll offer that to you today. So if you are wrestling to know whether you're a child of God, he offers himself to you freshly today. Look to Christ, run to him. Please pray with me. Father, I pray that you would cause our souls to arise and to shake off the guilty fears. Uh, that we would recognize that there is no guilt for those who have placed their faith and hope in Christ and in Christ alone for the forgiveness of their sins. The bleeding sacrifice in our behalf appears. Or please help us. Please make us whole. Or we want to be whole. No one wants to struggle with anxiety or fear or worry over the security of their soul. I pray that you would help all of my brothers and sisters who are truly in Christ to be more whole and complete in Christ and to feel that way. And Lord, I pray that if there are any who are outside of Christ, that you would awaken them, that you would not allow them to be uh, comfortable and self-deceived, but that you would lead them to Christ and that they would find life eternal in him. I pray all this in the name of Christ and for his glory. Amen. Well, now we have the special...